Hey guys, Drifter here. We're back with another video about matchmaking in Call of Duty. Today we're not just going to be talking about skill-based matchmaking, but also ping and location-based matchmaking because Call of Duty has released a new white paper in their matchmaking series called Ping. You may remember they promised to be more transparent about how matchmaking works, and this is part one of four of a series of white papers that they are publishing. The first one is paying. The second one coming in June is going to be the much more spicy one about skill-based matchmaking. On the very first page of it, you see that they shared this image, which was already infamous from the COD blog, that kind of outlines the multiplayer matching process. What we're going to do today is we are going to go through and talk about the important parts of this absolutely massive document and these graphs and these data and these figures that they've provided and try to provide some context and understanding for what's going on here. So it's gonna be an analysis video, we'll have some COD gameplay, we'll bounce back and forth for the important parts, but let's go ahead and jump right in with the most fun thing that all of you are super excited about, defining variables. Any reasonable white paper defines their variables very clearly first, and Call of Duty is no exception, so let's talk about that. Actually, one thing to point out before we talk about variables, I guess this is still variables. They define connection, time to match, playlist diversity, recent maps and modes, skill performance. These are just variables that they use to determine matchmaking. We're familiar with all of these. You've heard ping is king. I think the community might disagree with that statement. But one very interesting one is that they weren't, they were filtering on input device, platform, and also voice chat. This one is surprising. Voice chat enabled or disabled can change the matchmaking bucket or at least the variables that you're in. Not a lot of clarity about how or what the effect is there, but it's kind of surprising to see. On page three of the white paper, there's more terminology, things like dedicated server, delta ping, party, lobby, tick rate, DC is data center, BR is battle royale. But the most important one is this delta ping. This is the difference in a packet round tri trip between a player's best data center and the data center that they're playing on. So ping, as you think about it, is how long it takes your packet to get from your console to the Activision data server and make a difference. Delta ping, as I understood it, or as the community commonly defined it, to the best of my knowledge, and this is where I almost got a little confused, is the total round trip from you sending a packet to the server and the server receiving it and then sending back that packet to you that you're sort of registering that your change has taken place when you see the guy die versus when you start shooting and when the server sees it. Delta ping, as they define it, is the difference in a packet round trip between a player's best or optimal data center and the one that they're actually on, because it'll put you on suboptimal data centers in certain situations that aren't supposed to make much difference. But the delta ping, as they've defined it, is actually the difference between the optimal best ping and the one you're actually on, which is kind of a weird thing to measure, and we're going to loop back to that quite a number of times later on. Page four is mostly about the impact of ping on players and matchmaking time. The most interesting part about this is they mentioned that the game run, the server runs a game simulation. And if you remember that topic from about 12 years ago, we talked about lag compensation. Here's a quote for you. The Call of Duty netcode aims to reduce the perceived impact of latency, but can't eliminate it. High pings can cause anomalies such as players warping teleporting or apparently accurate shots missing the target i.e. lag compensation as we understood it over a decade ago. Uh, the server in the game itself has a little bit of a look ahead, a little bit predictive. It kind of helps smooth out some choppiness and lag. If you completely remove it from the game, the game is, can be quite choppy. And this is just sort of confirming that's a thing that exists. And they talk about it a little bit, which is very interesting. And in some way acknowledged warping and teleporting as being problems. There is a really interesting example about matchmaking wait time. And they start this example off with a million players in the game. And I think they did it because the community would say, if there's millions of people playing COD, why am I not matching on the best servers? Why am I matching with people that lag and weird things like that? Well, the example they gave is, assume there's a million users online, about 80% of those people are in the core matchmaking loop and about 20% are doing other things, just sitting in the menus, customizing characters, creating classes, something like that. Of the people that are in the core loop, the vast majority of them are in matches themselves. And the matchmaking time in an ideal scenario is pretty short. So that means 
that out of a million players, you can see the little graph they gave, it whittles down to about 13,000 people on average uh, currently searching for a match. But then you have to keep in mind that there are 40 global data centers and 40 playlist options available for multiplayer. So of that 13,000, you probably need to divide by 40 and then 40. And as you can see, you get down here to 320 players that are compatible, and then finally eight that you match with. These specific numbers here aren't as important as the goal. What the Call of Duty team was trying to communicate is that even though Call of Duty has a massive player base, due to the nature of the game, not that many people of the player base are actually in matchmaking at any given time. The number is much smaller than you might think. Page six starts talking about data centers for players, and they have this interesting graph that has firewalls and mountain ranges and distance. And what they're talking about is geolocation or IP-based physical distance, because in most cases, but not all, you would think the closer you are to a data center, the lower the ping would be. For example, I live in Dallas. It would make sense for me to connect to the Dallas data center since I ping about four milliseconds off of it, but I don't always do that. There's other reasons, but there's also fringe cases where you're kind of in between data centers or trace routes. In case you're unfamiliar with this concept, when you go through the internet, you're going through a, just a literal web, a gigantic confusing mess of interlaced servers and networks and computers that spread across the world in this big, uh, complex and also random spider web. And you have a trace route where your connection bounces through all of these things, eventually finding what it wants. And in most cases, reducing the physical distance is a shorter and therefore more efficient trace route, but not always. Sometimes there are physical barriers such as mountains, oceans, seas, firewalls, different regions and countries have rules and laws and they don't allow incoming connections and things like that. So the closest data center may not actually be the one that has the lowest ping to you. The example here shows a mountain range adding 90 milliseconds of ping, which is a little bit generous, but does happen in some parts of the world. And it's again, another thing that they wanted to clarify with the community now, they're, they're sort of like covering their bases on this. And I will say that the vast majority of the time, like probably 99% of the time, a closer data center is gonna have a shorter and better trace route, but not always. Sometimes things are just a little bit weird. The example they give is very generous of a player in Germany has a ping of 16 milliseconds to one data center, 18 to Holland and 22 in France. So even at the most extreme distance, it's only eight milliseconds of ping different or half or 120 F, uh, one frame of 120 FPS. So what they're saying is that a lot of times these are essentially the same and that's true in most situation. And they talk about this as a sort of trade-off. Uh, basically, they want to keep the match times very low so sometimes they'll go to a server that has a slightly higher ping in order for you to get a match quickly. And that's what they're talking about with Delta Pink. So let's go ahead and move on to a different example or something from this. There is one kind of bizarre thing in this paper. Uh, it's here on page seven, I believe it is. No, this is page eight. It says a game could aim to improve this by using matchmaking regions. If you're familiar with League of Legends or Apex or other games, you might know that there's North America, Europe, Oceania, Middle East. Uh, in some games, they have like different data centers for like East and West Europe, there's NA East, NA West, uh, there's South America, and some games do that. And I think they do that quite successfully. Honestly, it's kind of nice when I boot a game and it shows me what region I'm in and lets me, I think the finals does that. I can pick what matchmaking region to play in. And if there's a local outage or lag is really bad for any random number of things that could have gone wrong with the data center, I can just change my region. I think this works really well for most games and gives the player a sense of agency. Um, Call of Duty doesn't seem to do that. They sort of don't believe in that because they believe it leads to poor optimization of pings within regions. And especially, and this is actually, this is a very true one I agree with, suboptimal matching for players due to close border regions. Players in close border regions have a lot of problems in that regard. I'm gonna scroll down to the example. Uh, you can see that a lot of people in Turkey uh, because they're perfectly in between this sort of borderline, uh, a player in the country of Turkey could connect to a server in Germany or just as likely connect to a server in the Middle East that would in theory have about the same distance between them, but maybe not the same ping and maybe not the same Delta ping 
And even the difference between their delta ping, between whichever one of these is optimal, let's say the Middle East one, it might only be like five more milliseconds to connect to Germany, which wouldn't make any difference in your game. No human being would notice that. Page 10 has a very interesting section called Acceptable Data Center Backoff. And it's defined as a data center ping has a fixed component and a backoff. The fixed component is an absolute cutoff which the search will not match. This cutoff can depend on the location and search population. For example, players in North America with good pings have a much lower cutoff than players in Africa due to search population and data centers. That's when you hit matchmaking and it says searching and it's like looking for game, 20 milliseconds. Looking for game, 30 milliseconds. And it's kind of constantly going off. That's the cutoff. It's not going to uh, put you in anything more than that and it kind of has a stair-step approach to search for the best match over time. But this will vary wildly by region and individual uh, connections. And for example, people in North Africa might be waiting a very long time to play any game, so their cutoff or backup is going to be much bigger, thus giving them a bigger delta ping than if they connected to perhaps the most optimal server, which may not be available to them at the moment. But in North America and Europe, where there are more servers, this is far less of a problem. Call of Duty says that they use this uh, because the time-based backoff generally means that when there is a high search population, which is pretty often, players will match quickly and will get their best data center or one very close. If the search is waiting for a long time, this search for data centers will expand, expand and you might be put in one with higher ping. Before we move into the second half of the video, I wanted to give a quick shout out to my sponsor, Logitech G. My entire bed accessibility rig that you see me recording this on is powered by Logitech G. The headphones I'm wearing, the little keyboard you've seen me playing with, this is honestly my favorite, the super light mouse for twitchy FPS games, the microphone, even, and I, I kid you not on this, I'm going to try to hold it up for the camera without showing my own nudity. I have a sponsored Logitech G uh, blanket. So they power all of my equipment, everything that I do here. And the reason that I like their gear is it's all very, very lightweight. It's very simple, very plug and play, and it has shockingly good performance without being overly complicated, which again was absolutely perfect for a small space accessibility rig. So I would strongly encourage you to go check out my sponsor at logitechg.com. Code Drifter will get you 5% off anything. And again, the strongest recommendation I can make is for the super light mouse. It weighs about as much as a paper clip and is the best thing in the world for twitchy FPS games like Call of Duty, Apex, the final stuff like that. If you're an FPS gamer on PC, this is for you. The next section is about the matchmaking algorithm and search. It doesn't offer a lot of mathematical details, but kind of continues to explain things. In this section on page 11, I did find something very interesting. It's sort of a four-step process that they describe, and I'm gonna to skip to a graph in a minute. They talk about some searches are used as seeds, and all game modes and searches can be seeds. Uh, for each their seed, there is a list of candidate searches founding using a heuristic, which we covered actually just recently this year. Uh, they sort of pick a couple of factors such as physical distance, platform, control scheme, etc. Some kind of fast and dirty matching that keeps the computational complexity far lower and is a close enough approximation to what the community is and what they're doing that it has little to no impact on match quality. But there's this other section called a greedy algorithm is used to add candidate searches to a possible match for the seed such that the matching constraints are satisfied and a quality score is maximized for each candidate added, which is where the bulk of the work is being done. So that's kind of a mouthful. We're going to scroll down to this graph, which is honestly also a little bit confusing. We're going to pause here for just a moment to kind of explain this. Each one of these dots is a search, a person searching for a match. So what the computer will do, instead of trying to comp compute everything for every person, it'll pick a thousand of those and treat them as seeds or uh, something that it's going to compute. Apply the heuristic to the seed, and then they'll find candidates for the seed, 400. So uh, the gray dots are all searches. The green dots are uh, candidates. The red dots are seeds and uh, the one particular seed, I should say. And the, I can't see colors very well. I believe that's orange or people that you have actually matched with. The take home here, and also I find it very weird that this has a latitude and longitude that these variables aren't defined, but okay. 
I guess latitude and longitude are miles, directions. We're talking a lot about physical location. That's possible. Uh, but what it's saying is uh, this is how it takes a sort of mathematical shortcut to make the matchmaking faster. It doesn't compute all data of all players all at once. That would blow up the servers. It picks a few, makes those seeds, tries to match people to the seeds, and then starts trying to produce individual matches. So it's sort of a, uh, a whittling down process. Man, what an old school word. I do find it odd that underneath this graph, there's a section that says, as previously discussed, geographical distance is not a perfect approximation for data center pings. So the use of distance in the candidate heuristic may not provide optimal candidates for data center matching. In practice, however, with large enough candidate set, it has been a good enough approximation. So it is an approximation that they're using. Uh, I, I, it a little really worries me that they're very intent that geographical distance is not a perfect approximation for ping and data center matching, which is true. On a technical sense, it's very true, but that's a heuristic that you can really rely on. That's a really good mental shortcut because most of the time a shorter distance is better. Like, I don't know why they're kind of hammering home that part so hard. Page 13 has a section that says, thanks to the large number of data centers used around the world, 94% of Call of Duty players have a best data center ping of 50 milliseconds or lower. Sure, you've got the data. I don't. I think the community would disagree with you. I know a great number of people that would kill for 50 milliseconds. Could be a bad sampling, but the math does kind of check out. They tend to build data centers in very high population areas, which have more gamers. That's probably true. They do have these very interesting maps of a distribution of median ping and percentage of players. So you can see almost all players, according to this graph, have a best ping of less than 20 milliseconds. And even up here at about the 90 to 95% mark, it's still under 40 milliseconds and under 50 up to about 95%. This graph is probably very, very correct. Uh, here's another interesting one though on Delta ping. This is the difference between connecting to your true optimal perfect data center, let's say you're in this good zone down here close to zero like me in Dallas, uh, versus the server that you're actually playing on. And this, what this shows you is that about 80 to 75% of players get pings uh, 10 milliseconds or less delta than their optimal servers. That is saying a lot though, that's only when they get matched out of region and ideally, when you get matched out of region, what it's supposed to do, according to the white paper, is only affect your ping about 10 milliseconds for most people. And 90% of people are within 20 milliseconds, which is about 20 milliseconds is where about hardcore gamers are going to start noticing things. Again, it's very weird to me to measure best server versus actual server, but it's that's what we're working with here today in this paper. Moving down, there are very complicated, uh, they're not quite, I guess I suppose they're graphs, they're sort of box diagrams here that shows the, this is very mathematically specific, the median delta ping on Modern Warfare 3 launch across all regions and across all game modes. Uh, this is, we might actually have to crop some of this and zoom in. But as you can see, we have East Asia, Europe, Middle East, North America, Oceania, South America, South Africa, and South America. We got zombies, hard point, control, all these different things. And what this section talks about is your median delta ping. This is not average, as many of you would understand it. This is median. If you remember your seventh grade statistics class, this is the a median is almost the most frequent because uh, an average you could have, you just see this in population statistics, a whole bunch of low income people and one Elon Musk. And the average of that population is like everybody's a billionaire. The median is you put them all in a row uh, from poorest to richest and you look at right in the middle. So it gives you a better idea of a population sample and it would say, okay, most of these people are low income. They're doing a similar thing here with median Delta pink. It's not average, probably because they don't want people with absurdly big ping skewing the data all the way across the board. And the median delta ping across a lot of regions is apparently zero. Uh, we do have these colored tiles that are 153, 144. That's a lot in South Africa for less popular modes. I guess it's modes that are not popular in Africa. They kick them to Europe and they lag like crazy. But what it's showing is very low delta pings all over the world, indicating that most people are on their best server or close to it. Now, they do have a graph 
of the 90th percentile delta ping. This is the bottom 10% of laggers, the people in the world with the worst connections. And what it's showing is the delta, not the absolute ping. Absolute ping could be a thousand milliseconds here. It's only measuring the difference. The difference for these people with bad connections between their best server and the server they're actually on is, at least in North America, about 20 milliseconds or less for most game modes. It's even better in Europe, but other regions are kind of nightmarish. I still find this description to be very confusing because we're talking about things like median delta ping and what players at home want to know is why is my ping above a certain amount? I know it's been disabled in the, in the game for a while now. Uh, very, very weird, uh, but it still shows most of the more populous regions in the world where, where Call of Duty is popular performing very, very well. They also have one of these for search time. I didn't find that particularly insightful. And then finally near the end, we have this really, really sort of fascinating uh, graph. I don't know how quite to describe this. It says Modern Warfare 3 average player delta ping by average skill percentile. And we have this almost weighted bucket uh, line graph. I noticed they're using averages here and I'm not sure why. But what it shows, basically the fatter this bar is, you can see these triangle shapes at the bottom, they're not cosmetic. That represents how many of people in that population bucket have that ping. So for example, uh, the, skill, the perfectly average skill percentile bracket, 50%, you're the most average COD player in the world. The vast majority of them, because this area is bigger, uh, is under 20 milliseconds. And as you move outside of the 20 milliseconds range, it's just a collection of people that are ultimately anomalies. You can even see the little dots up here. Uh, but you can take a look at any of these have a slightly different shape. Yeah, yeah. Here's You can see how the slightly different shapes at the very bottom, people that have truly terrible skills. There's actually more of these people that have better ping than there are people in the top of the skill bracket that have better ping. But it's very, very minor. This almost looks like top-shaped UFOs. Uh, this graph is unusual to me but the reason they put it out is to communicate that there isn't much difference in connection over uh, across skill levels that high skill players have about the same delta ping as low skill players if you ignore these people kind of in the anomaly brackets which is going to be a very small percentage of them so again it is to say that players average ping or a probably average ping and also average delta ping doesn't change very much by skill bracket, which is the exact opposite of what Exclusive Ace and I found. We found that players that had were higher in the skill bracket had on average worse connections than those not. Now we were measuring absolute connections instead of this delta variable they've come up with. Uh, but what Call of Duty is saying is that people in the high skill brackets are not getting added very much ping, or at least no more than the people in the bottom brackets for the sake of fast matching. Oh, also this page has one really funny typo called Dela Ping. I, I know, I have to point it out. I noticed that I do typos like this all the time. You should see my social media posts. No knock to that team. And they have a references section where they reference uh, Call of Duty Netcode Explained, which is a, uh, a YouTube video. Uh, they have Blizzard Entertainment papers, they have one from FIFA, and one really weird one here is if you click this, this takes you right back to the same page. It's like a self-referential document. I'm not sure if that's exactly scientifically sound, but that is what they chose to do with it. Okay, man, we have gone over a lot, analyzing a lot of different stuff today to the best of my ability. I wanted to keep this short. It's, uh, my recording time, it's looking like a 30 minute video just going over the highlights of the paper. So I'm going to try to explain to you how I understand this, what I think about it. And also, uh, I actually went over this paper in tandem with J-Hub, like students in college, he was here visiting, helping me build some things. So, um, it was for the eclipse. So we kind of went over this together and I'm going to share uh, my take and his take. They're very different, but they do reflect different pers uh, perspectives of the community. We'll start with J-Hub. Quote, what they're doing is using specifically chosen data with different forms of visual graphing systems to push the narrative that they're actually right with what is occurring. It is very convenient that they're releasing this white page while the in-game notification system no longer shows you what ping you are playing on. It's been disabled and currently not working. My opinion is not radically different. My opinion is that what Call of Duty is doing is actually very much so industry standard 
for modern games. They're not doing anything crazy. There's not anything wild about skill matching. All of the considerations that they have for uh, physical location, geolocation, ping, the border issue, uh, delta ping, and things like that are all very real and very true things that almost every game has to deal with. The, we'll say, interesting thing is that they chose delta ping instead of absolute ping. I think that is a very confusing variable. It even tripped me up at first. I almost analyzed this whole paper wrong because I didn't read the definitions carefully enough. That's on me. Not a lot of people are going to quite get that concept. And I do believe that the data that was presented is ultimately incongruent with player experiences. What you experience in Call of Duty is not nearly as positive as this uh, particular paper. It doesn't have the same uh, delta. You don't like. You don't know what delta ping is. You just know that you're lagging. You don't know anything about your best data server. You don't know what region you're in. Other people might need a fast match, and they'll throw them over to your server. You get that one guy from South Africa with 200 milliseconds ping. That makes your game worse because you're shooting some guy teleporting all over the map. It's also incongruent with exclusive Ace and Ice testing. As you may remember, uh, we did some testing about skill-based matchmaking, and it was actually Ace that made the breakthrough on this part of the analysis that uh, as your skill level increased, so did your um, median ping. Uh, I believe we presented that in a different YouTube video. What they're saying is that you get about the same ping regardless of your skill level, and that high skill players, at least Delta ping was what they provided wasn't very different, but what Ace and I's direct testing indicated was that was not the case. So I'm not going to go out wild conspiracy stuff. Activision is lying. 99% of this paper is very industry standard matchmaking stuff. What I do think, though, is that it is a little bit of good PR. Uh, the numbers are quite small because they're measuring numbers that most people don't think about. And at the end of the day, my experience, the experience of my friends, the experience of all the comments you guys leave, Reddit, the random people, like random people that I meet on the street that aren't even engaged in this kind of stuff that, you know, maybe see me wearing a Call of Duty shirt, they all quite frequently, frequently complain about connection issues in the game. So despite this very positive looking paper that has a lot of good things to say and data that's reported, uh, you know, that their systems are working quite well, at the end of the day, people's experiences aren't matching that. And you can make with that what you will, that the community's right and the company's wrong, that the company's right and the community is full of a bunch of people that are just mad because they're bad. That's kind of for you to decide. Today, I was just trying to analyze this as good as possible. I hope that you enjoyed this video. I hope that you learned something useful. If you did, don't forget to like, favorite, and subscribe. Drifter out.